live it's Sunday after Pentecost. The abyss was taken from St. Paul's letter, letter to the Catholics in Corinth. Chapter 10. Brother, let us not covet evil things as they also coveted. Either become idolaters as so of them as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them that committed fornication, and there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted and perished by the serpents. Neither do you murmur, as some of them murmured and were destroyed by the exterminator. Now all these things happen to them in figure, and they are written for our correction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, he that thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed, lest he fall. Let no temptation take hold on you, but such as is human. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will make all also with temptation issue that, that you may be able to bear it. The Holy Gospel. Take it from St. Luke chapter 19. At that time when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also hast known, and that in this thy day the things are unto thy peace, and now they are hidden from thy eyes, for the days will come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench around thee, encompass thee around, and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat to the ground. And thy children who are in thee, and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone. This, this, this was fulfilled literally in the year 70, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem. And uh, a few weeks ago, about two months ago, the Pope was praying with Hindus, Jews, and uh, Muslims at the and went to the Jewish wailing wall to pray. And uh, the Jews think it's the temple, but Christ said, no, a stone upon a stone will even stand. And we know today that the wall, that the wailing wall is not even the temple walls, it's the part of the fortress of Hadrian. And uh, God shows his great displeasure by the Pope's ecumenism, because within a few weeks, the bombings already started. There was no peace brought by these false prayers, it, it brought war. Wherever the popes bring all these ecumenical prayers, God punishes with wars. Because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation, and entering into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for your uh, hospitality and receiving um, the traveling pilgrims. The boys on this trip, 14 boys, have already seen quite a bit of the great men of God, the great men who have sacrificed a wife, children, home, family, uh, their lands to come and bring the kingship of Christ to this country, uh, to North and South America. And they saw many of the missions already, St. Saint, Saint Xavier down in Tucson, Arizona, built by Father uh, Kino, and also the great missions started under the Spaniards, the Franciscans in New Mexico, and some of the ruins that still stand. And uh, these great priests who came to convert these Indians to the true Catholic faith, not to dialogue about cultural diversity, but to bring them to the true religion so they don't go to hell. That's what it's about. And they were surprised to find <clears throat> numerous, numerous tribes of Indians throughout Mexico, Arizona, Texas, uh, and New Mexico, 
and even Colorado and parts of California, this whole southwest region, over 500 apparitions of Venerable Mary of Agreda. She bilocated from Spain, and the Indians saw this blue nun dressed in blue. Her habit was the Franciscans of the Immaculate Conception. And she taught them the faith, and she told them, and sometimes with a screaming on the bell, with a loud voice holding a cross, you must receive the true faith, and you must go and get the priests that are up in Santa Fe, and ask them to bring you the baptism and the sacraments and the mass and confession. And so the tribes of Indians, the leaders would go in search of the, the Franciscan priests. And the priests would come and be received with processions and flowers and feastings and festivals. <clears throat> and they discovered they all knew the seven sacraments, the four marks of the church, the four last things, the twelve fruits of the Holy Ghost, the, eight, the bag beatitudes, the, the basic stories of the parables of our Lord. And they knew how to go to confession, and they asked, how do you know all this? They said, well, the blue nun, the lady dressed in blue, she comes. And so the boys got to go to St. Augustine Church, which is in the East Isleta Pueblo Indian Reservation. And there, to our discovery, uh, it was in that very spot where Blessed Mary Margreta also walked in the town. And the town is very primitive dirt roads and, and adobes everywhere. It's quite interesting. And we also discovered that in the church lies the incorrupt body of America's first martyr, who was killed by the pagan Indians in, in Kansas, Lyons, Kansas, Father Juan de Vidia, a great Spanish Catholic Franciscan priest. He was killed, they, took, they, they brought the body to uh, New Mexico, and it's there in that church of St. Augustine, in this Veta Pueblo, about 45 minutes south of Albuquerque. The body is incorrupt. And they, the people, all the townspeople know. And even we stopped at a museum to get directions, because it's pretty hard to find. Uh, and everybody knows about, oh, that's the body that's been rising. That's the body that's been rising. Because when it floods, his body over the past 500 years has been rising up to the ground. And they see this priest. He's totally incorrupt. And so they said, well, he won't rise anymore because we use concrete and barbed wire. And now he's, he's fastened to the, underneath. And uh, sad to say, he's not even marked. His tomb and his place in the church is not even marked. Uh, while this country, at the request of the president, should be honoring the first martyr of this country. And it should be a place of pilgrimage to see this incorrupt body, miraculously preserved, of a priest who, who came here not to bring the Masonic idea of goddess liberty, not to bring the false idea of equality, not to bring modern democracy, but to bring our Lord Jesus Christ as king. And the true conquistadora, the true statue of liberty, <coughs> of the true liberty of the children of God, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so the, we got to see that as well. also in Santa Fe, the boys, we prayed and put all our intentions at the feet of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the true Statue of Liberty of our country, the real one. She's only about that tall because they had to transport her from Spain. But it was Father uh, Alonso de Naveda who brought the statue into the city. And, this, and there was a huge fire later, and the, the statue was saved, and then there was fights, with the Indian raids, and all that. But Our Lady La Conquistadora triumphed and converted all these souls. And many of them died, many of these tribes of Indians died and moved out. But the labors were not lost, because they saved, these, these priests and Franciscans saved many, many souls, thousands and thousands of Indian souls. And that's the real glory of our history, the, the Catholicization of our country, of the world. And that's the command of Christ the King. Go, he said to the apostles, go and dialogue with all religions. Is that what he said? Go express your cultural diversity and share liturgical ecumenical ceremonies. Is that what Christ said? 
Absolutely not. Our Lord Jesus Christ is king. He came to conquer over the kingdom of the devil. And his, his victory was the cross. And he's the king dressed in purple by his blood, crowned with thorns. That's our king. And he loves each soul, and he cleanses each soul with his precious blood by the, through the sacraments. And that is the victory of our faith. And, and we are here again, found in a barn, found in the hotel rooms, found in garages. That's where we are at again in the history of the Catholic Church. We are at that point again. And it happened St. Lawrence's time. Oh, here we are again, Mass in the catacombs, Mass in basements. And then after the persecutions, uh, more persecutions during the Arian crisis, when the Emperor and the Pope were both crushing the Catholic religion by Arian and semi-Arian heresy. And St. Athanasius and all the Catholic people had to say, oh, here we are again, back in the garage masses, back in the hotel room, back in the basements. And then, so many years later, <clears throat> the persecutions in the, by the Orthodox in Eastern uh, Europe, <clears throat> again, the Catholics found themselves in this situation. <coughs> the French Revolution, St. John Vianney, he was your age, little Richard and Teresa, and little, uh, well, that's Teresa, that's Bernadette. Uh, the, at your age, St. John Vianney and his little sisters are going to Mass in a barn at midnight. And the priest had to come, say Mass, hear confession, and then go to the next barn to take care of souls because they were being hunted down and deported and policed by the Masonic armies. And it was the great Bande soldiers, the men and the boys, who rose up and said, we've had enough of this. Christ is king of our nation. We will not submit to the destruction of our country and the monarchy. And they fought for the reign of Christ the king. But, but <clears throat> where did the people find themselves? Back to mass in the woods, back to mass in the garage, back to mass in the hotel. Nothing new. Protestant England, Protestant Germany, same thing. Catholics having mass, priests being hunted down. If the family was caught that housed the priest, that family was arrested and put in prison, often executed by brutal hang, drawn, and quarter. Many brave women, St. Anne Line, and uh, other brave women of that time took care of the priests, made their vestments, and hid them. And some of the priests had to dress in disguise, like Father Parsons, the Jesuit superior, who himself went into England to say mass and take care of the souls. And they dressed as merchants, they dressed as pirates, they dressed as sailors. And at one time, <clears throat> Father Parsons was in the bar. And in the bar, that's where the, where the Catholics would meet. So they'd be playing cards, smoking cigars, having shots of uh, whiskey. And when the coast was clear, they'd open the floors. And the priest would put the cards down, put the cigar down, and say, to start teaching them the Catholic catechism because some of the Protestants secretly wanted to convert. And when the, when the guards were seen, the, police, the Protestant guards were coming around, they just closed the boards, light up the cigars again, pour more, pour more whiskey, and play cards. And that's how the priests had to do it. And both, many of these priests, many, many hundreds, were arrested, many of them betrayed by fellow Catholics. Fellow Catholics betrayed them. And they were arrested, put to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Nothing new, but the Catholics to have mass, where they have to go? Back to the barns, back to the houses, hotel rooms, and basements. Nothing new in our history. And same in Mexico, during the great persecutions of the Freemasons in Mexico, the Freemasons of New York City, of Italy, France, all got together the Judeo-Masons, and they said, we must, to bring about the one world order for the Antichrist, we have to topple down the monarchies and bring in democracy, and we have to get rid of the most Catholic countries on earth. And all the fingers pointed to Mexico. Because that ground was sacred. That ground was Catholic. There were universities 
a hundred years before Yale or Harvard even hit this side of the, of the continent. There were already, a, Mexico University was already producing teachers that were teaching in Europe in many languages. So when we think of Mexico, we think of burrito eating dusty people. But these, these, they were they had a whole nation of saints and monks and nuns and incorrupt bodies that are still there now. Saint Raphael Gitsa was totally incorrupt, and Saint Blessed Sebastian de Burizio, another he's ninety something years old when he died. He died in 1700, the time of George Washington. George Washington, the Freemason, is dust and ashes. But this blessed Franciscan is still incorrupt. You can still see him, his face. And so Mexico was the territory Our Lady converted, and she wanted North America as well. She appeared in the center of North America and South America, right in the middle, because all of it belongs to her son. All of it. So, again, during those persecutions, the Catholics, where did they go to Mass? Back to the mountains, back to the garages, Father Pro had to, one time he was coming to a house to say Mass. The guards turned the corner and they were walking right towards him. Well, Father Pro was pretty quick and pretty witty. So he grabbed the closest lady he could find, and he grabbed her arm and he, he said, uh, just pretend you're my wife. And he walked down the, the road holding her arm and she holding his. And as they passed, he said, uh, thanks for your help. And he took off down the street, went down to the basement, put his cassock on, put his surplice on, heard confessions, said mass, told the people, these are the days like the Maccabees, you've got to fight to keep the faith. And, uh, and then he was finally betrayed by a Catholic, a traditional Catholic, and he was arrested, and he was uh, gloriously shot with his brother and a few other martyrs. How many priests martyred? And how many of you faithful and kids had to go to Mass back in the garage, barn, and hotel rooms? And here we are again. Here we are again. Vatican II. And gentlemen, you came here, you see this dusty old barn, and you're probably wondering, well, where's the nice chapels? Because most of our traditional Society of St. Pius X youth, you've all grown up. Now, you all had pretty much chapels to grow up in with nice rugs, nice sacristies, that, that your parents had to work hard to fund for, and you have schools, and now we have a college in St. Mary's, and we have some religious orders sprinkled throughout the earth. And here you grow up with tradition. You don't know the new mass. You don't know the battle of the revolution of Vatican II. You grew up cradled and bottled and diapers changed in Catholic tradition. But guess what? Gentlemen, we're back to the barn, back to the hotel rooms again. Why? Why? 25, 30, 40 years ago, your parents and grandparents had to go to Mass where? In a hotel room, in the garage, in the basements, in the barns. And all the gray haired people know exactly what I'm talking about because they did it. And why were they doing something so crazy? Why didn't you stay in their parish? Why didn't you just stay in your parish church where you were baptized and received communion? Because of the new Mass. Because of Vatican II, which was destroyed by Lord Jesus Christ as God and King. That's why. And so we're back at it again because Bishop Fillet and the leaders of the Society of Pius X, as Father Nelly himself told a priest a few months ago, the train is going to Rome, you don't like it, get off it. And Bishop Fillet has been set for, now we know, from the beginning of his position as Superior General, he has been dead set on preparing this agreement with Rome, betraying our Lord Jesus Christ, betraying Archbishop Lefebvre, our founder. And what's the proof? Oh, Father, you're getting, you're ranting and raving over rumors. Well, I'll give you the proof. And the proof you can look on, it's documented, it's in the core unum of the priest bulletin, and it's now very public. And, and most of it's on the desk of Rome, alive and kicking. What are the five proofs? The general's chapter statement. That overthrew the principle of Archbishop Lefebvre. 
No agreement with Rome until Rome comes back to the Catholic faith. Period. Period. Would you mothers let the crack house down the street, the druggies, and babysit your children? And if they made the agreement, well, we won't smoke in front of them, we won't do drugs in front of them. Would you still trust them to these crooks? Of course not. Would you, would you entrust all of Catholic families and our schools and our missions and our priests and nuns under these criminals of Rome, modernist Rome, who mock our Lord Jesus Christ, who have a new mass that deteriorates him to a, a hippie, and like false ecumenism, and religious liberty that uncrowns him and attacks his divinity? Can we make peace with these enemies of Jesus Christ? No! Absolutely not! And that's, that's where we're at now, and the Chifalayan leaders are dead set on this. The general chapter statement, the six conditions, wherein, they're, they're, they're all bad, they're all bad, but one of them especially, to be, to be put under the local diocesan bishops. Uh, we can have our Latin Mass under the, under the bishops and be regular, be cool, be normalized under the same bishops who are allowing other churches in the same diocese to be used for dignity Masses, rock and roll Masses, all kinds of nonsense Masses, pervert Masses, and I won't give detail for the sake of the children, and that goes on in every diocese, the Rainbow Mass. No details needed. And all this cries to heaven for vengeance, as it mocks the true God, mocks the true King, Jesus Christ, our King, the true God who died on the cross. Second, third proof, rather than fourth. The letter of Bishop Filet and the superiors to the three bishops. That should have waken everybody up. This is pure modernism. And as Father Jahir said, the great old monk and abbot of his monastery in Brazil, who knew Bishop de Castro Mayor and his friends of Don Thomas Aquinas, and his monks, we got about 15 monks, solid, great men of God. And they built their monastery from the ground up. And when he saw that letter, he said, for me that was enough. And as he himself said, that was the window of grace for all the society priests to realize the new direction and speak out against it and be expelled or kicked out or silenced or whatever, but they should never have gone along with it. And he says, because many priests have closed that door of grace, they are losing, they are slipping, they are sliding to the new direction. And we see that happening. Good, solid priests who are being more and more silenced, duct taped against Vatican II, not the Vatican II of 65, but the Vatican II entering the Society of Pius X in tradition now. And they're silent about it, and they're betraying the flock, they're betraying the sheep because the wolves are just working right in. And now we hear people say, well, we should make an agreement with Rome. Traditional Catholic people in Post Falls, St. Mary's, Syracuse, all say, well, we should get an agreement with Rome. Bishop Fillet is right. 